On the 18th of January 1977, Egypt erupted into a huge popular uprising against the government's removal of food subsidies. For two days, hundreds of thousands of people across the country were variously involved in strikes, riots, occupations, looting and sabotage, while around 70 people were killed and over 500 injured. Described by the president at the time, Anwar al-Sadat, as the uprising of thieves, the Egyptian people called it by a different name, the Bread Uprising. This is Working Class History. Just before we start, a quick note that we are only able to continue making these podcasts because of the support of our listeners on Patreon. If you like what we do and want to help us with our work, join us on patreon.com slash workingclasshistory where you can get benefits like early access to episodes, exclusive bonus content, discounted books, merch, and more. You'll also be able to listen to part two and the bonus content for this episode right now. Link in the show notes. In order to talk about the 1977 uprising, it's important to put it in the context of social tensions which had been growing in Egypt in the decade leading up to it. As such, this episode will focus a bit more on the increasingly radical struggles of workers and students in Egypt leading up to 1977, while the next episode will look at the events of the uprising itself. For these episodes, we spoke to Egyptian journalist and revolutionary socialist Hossam El Hamalawi. As Hossam explains, many countries around the world were affected by the post-1968 wave of radicalism and rebellion. Egypt was no exception. When uprisings happen, uh, they don't just happen out of the blue. Uh, They usually are preceded by uh, a long process where dissent and anger is brewing on the one hand and on the other hand the people or the masses have been struggling and getting into small fights here and there whereby they are gaining experience they are tweaking uh, their own strategy and tactics uh, related to the struggle so when an uprising explodes It is usually a climax uh, of a long process that started uh, before it. In the case of Egypt, I would say that the 1977 uh, uprising was the climax of a process that started in 1968. Much of the radical protest which took place in Egypt came as a result of its defeat to Israel in the 1967 war, where Israel would go on to occupy Egypt's Sinai Peninsula, the Golan Heights in Syria, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. This made a significant dent in the popularity of Egypt's president, Gamal Abdel Nasser, and his brand of Arab socialism. So in 1967, Egypt suffered one of its worst military defeats in its modern history, if not its own entire history, where in six days, the Egyptian army, as well as other Arab armies, were completely smashed by the Israeli army, and Sinai was occupied, Uh, the Golan Heights in Syria were occupied, the rest of the Palestinian territories that were not occupied in 1948 were swallowed by Israel. So it was a catastrophe on all levels. And it wasn't just a military catastrophe, it was an ideological and political catastrophe. Because for two decades, the radical Arab nationalists mainly led by Nasser in Egypt and the Ba'ath in Syria and Iraq, were uh, basically promising the liberation of Palestine. They were promising socialism and, and equality. They were promising liberation. And in the name of these uh, noble goals, they repressed their own people using the most horrific militaristic dictatorial tools for social control. and. When it was showtime, they failed miserably. Conventional histories of the Middle East often claim that the defeat of secular Arab nationalism in 1967 saw the Arab world turn en masse to Islamist politics. However, as Hossam explains, this is not quite the case. Indeed, many in the Arab world were instead radicalised further to the left. If you refer to the, um, to the classical literature about Middle Eastern politics, The right-wing historians usually will tell you that after the failure 
of the secular Arab nationalism in 1967, the Arabs, you know, started flocking towards Islamism as an alternative. This is not really accurate characterization. When the 1967 defeat happened, the masses started to radicalize further to the left, further to the left of the regime and further to the left of the existing Arab communists at the time. As Hossam explains, there were very practical reasons for this move beyond the communist parties of the Arab world at this time. The Arab communist movement, whether it's in Egypt or elsewhere, was heavily Stalinized and was mainly moving within the orbit of Moscow. So this meant that the Arab communists wasted several opportunities to push for the struggle forward for social liberation and for the achievement of socialism, but they always opted for alliances with their own regimes. And their relation towards the regimes was always a function, more or less, of the regime's relations with the Soviet Union. So this meant that the Egyptian Communist Party, for example, dissolved itself in 1964 and called on its members to flock and join the Arab Socialist Union that was founded by Nasser. Arab communists everywhere were just getting into alliances with the so-called the most progressive sections of our local bourgeoisie. So this meant by the time that 1967 happened and the masses started looking for an alternative, they were really angry, not just at Nasser, but they were also angry at the communists who for years were advocating support for Nasser and support for Arab nationalism. Following its defeat in the 1967 war then, and three months before the first barricades would go up in the streets of Paris, Egypt would begin its own 1968. In order to deflect blame for the defeat, air force leaders in the Egyptian army were put on trial, but ultimately given very light sentences. So this angered the Egyptian students who started protesting on the campuses and then they took to the streets and they started fraternizing with the workers who were also protesting in Helwan. Helwan is south of Cairo and it, it is a historical hotbed for industrial militancy and that's where our steel mills historically have been located. So the workers from Helwan in addition to the students, took to the streets and they were chanting against the army, but they were not chanting against Nasser. Nasser still had political credit uh, at the time. And obviously the police in its usual fashion responded by live ammunition against the protesters. And it was a horrific scene of repression. The repression started against the workers in Hilwan who left their steel mills and they took to the streets and they were chanting against the military court uh, judges who gave the light sentences to the Air Force generals. And they were chanting against the Air Force generals uh, themselves. They were comparing the light sentences that were given to them to the enormous loss of life uh, of Egyptian soldiers. So the police opened live ammunition against the Hilwan workers. I cannot now remember exactly the number of casualties in terms of uh, deaths, but it was a horrific bloodbath. So the workers in Hilwan, they sent delegations to the protesting students in Cairo. And to be more specific, at the Ain Shams University, which is like the second largest university we have in Egypt after Cairo University. And that's where the protest, the student protest started. So the Helwan workers, uh, delegations, when they went to the students and they told them what happened and briefed them on the situation, anger boiled even more. And you started to have joint protests between the workers and the students. And these protests, you know, were di- Initially, they were trying to march over the parliament. They couldn't make it all the way over there. And uh, in Helwan, they stormed the police stations from where the soldiers and the officers opened fire on the workers and they demolished the entire police station. Nasser was shocked 
he could not believe that, you know, these things could happen, that the Egyptians were rebelling against him. So he made some concessions that he dubbed as the 30th of March Manifesto, where he acknowledged that, you know, there is no democracy in Egypt and we will, you know, give more freedoms and we will do this and we'll do that. He gave some rosy promises, which, of course, nothing happened. The February 1968 protests were a rebellion on a scale which Egypt had not seen since the 1950s, when Nasser himself had come to power. And with its slogan of there's no socialism without freedom, the rebellion paved the way for further dissent, which took place in November that same year. What was the trigger of the protests in November 68, which was a much more militant uh, show of dissent against the regime than in February? The trigger started in Mansoura. Mansoura is one of the important urban centers in the Nile Delta. The trigger was, it was a government decision aimed at reforming secondary education in Egypt. So school students took to the streets in Mansoura and they were met also with repression. And the police also fired like live ammunition at them. And the news started to trickle everywhere. And this time, the bulk of the protests were in Alexandria, not uh, Cairo. I mean, Cairo did witness protests, but, you know, the real militant protests were in Alexandria. Alexandria uh, is the second biggest city we have in Egypt, and it's a coastal city. And of course, it has its historical and political significance. So the students in Alexandria battled the police for several days under heavy rain. And uh, the police opened also live ammunition against the protesters. Dozens were killed. And at some point, the army, the Egyptian army, sent in uh, choppers to fly on a very low height so as to intimidate uh, the students. And for the first time, you started to hear strong anti-Nasser chants, chants that were not there in February 68, the, the movement was repressed right away by, uh, by the police and by the army intimidation. But also Nasser had to make some concessions in exchange, uh, not just repression. So, for example, he pushed the Egyptian army to increase its operations against the Israeli occupation in Sinai. Uh, and there were like some famous battles around that time. And I would say that, and and others also would argue, the main goal was to give the impression to the public that we are fighting the war of liberation. So please do not split our ranks, do not cause any internal problems regarding this. But there is also something else that we have to put into consideration, which was Egypt and the Arab world were not disconnected from the rest of the world. And the radicalization that was happening in Egypt after the defeat was a radicalization largely to the left. Why? Because all of the models of success, uh, quote unquote, of course, uh, that were in front of the masses at the time were left leaning. People were comparing the Egyptian army's dismal performance to the Viet Cong, for example, in Vietnam. And they are like, you know, the Vietnamese can stand up to the Americans. Why can't you stand up to the Israelis? The killing uh, of Che Guevara, for example, also was, was something that impacted Egyptian students, and he was regarded as an icon. And people were making comparisons between a self-sacrificing guerrilla fighter and those like, you know, rich socialists who are like preaching socialism, but at the same time, they are living as parasites on the lives of the masses. Thirdly, that this was also the time when the Cultural Revolution or the so-called Cultural Revolution in China was happening. And while we today understand that the Cultural Revolution was basically uh, a fight among the Chinese bureaucracy and an attempt by Mao to solidify his position within the ruling clique in China, but for the rest of the world, they regarded what was happening in China as a student-led rebellion against bureaucracy, against counter-revolutionary elements in the regime. So someone like my father, 
for example, my father at the time was a TA, was a teaching assistant at Ain Shams University. And he was uh, one of the young senior ranking members of the so-called Organization of Socialist Youth, which was the youth wing of the regime's party, the Arab Socialist Union. My father, after the defeat in 67, went back home and tore down Nasser's posters in his room and put up Mao's. Because for him, like, you know, I mean, Mao was like, you know, the inspiration and he's like the true socialist. And what's happening in China was what we need uh, in Egypt. And my father was not alone uh, at the time. After 1968, groups of young communists started popping up all over Egypt. However, in 1970, Nasser died suddenly and was replaced by Anwar al-Sadat, who promised to liberate Sinai from Israeli occupation. In 1973, the Egyptian army crossed the Suez and liberated a strip along the canal in what would commonly become known as the Yom Kippur War. While in reality the performance of the Egyptian army during the conflict was actually quite poor, Sadat was able to use the war to lobby the American government into giving him some leeway, so as to assure them that Egypt was moving from the Soviet to the American camp. As a result, this allowed Sadat to present the war as a huge victory. However, as a consequence, with questions of national defence now seemingly resolved, social questions now began to take precedence. So the people were like, okay, so we fought the war, we liberated uh, our land. Now, can we please now talk about our domestic uh, situation? And our domestic situation was not just bread and butter issues. Because remember, I mean, this was a war economy. Everything was geared towards the army. Uh, Everything was uh, geared towards the war efforts. And if anyone objected to austerity measures or to cuts in wages or to cuts in subsidies, you know, they were told that, you know, we're in a state of war and you should not be selfish. you You should not be greedy. Now that the war was over and Sadat was saying, and the days of the socialism of poverty, that's how he used to describe socialism, uh, the socialism of poverty, are over. And now we're going to open up our economy. And, you know, the, the, the investments and foreign direct investments are going to flood into the country. And we will finally get to live like any Western capitalist advanced societies. So this gave boost, actually, to the labor movement. The labor movement prior to 1974 was not completely dormant, even with the war. So, for example, in 1971, in 1972, and in 1973 itself, there were wildcat strikes here and there. So the Shubra al-Khema textile workers, Shubra al-Khema is a district uh, in Cairo that is also one of the historical hotbeds for uh, industrial militancy, and uh, the textile sector was largely concentrated uh, in it. So the textile workers in Shobra al-Khema, they went on uh, several industrial actions. The cab drivers in Cairo, they went, uh, they also went on strike. The Shibini Kom, uh, which is uh, located in Munufiya, Munufiya is also another province in the Nile Delta, And it is one of the also historical hotbeds for industrial militancy. So these wildcat strikes were happening here and there, but not something that is generalized and consistent and sustained. But 1974, this started to change uh, the rules of the game. Because on the one hand, the war was over. Number two, Sadat could not any longer ask the public to to accept austerity or to accept dictatorial measures because we're in a state of war. So there wasn't this ideological hegemony or ideological excuse. Thirdly, is that in 1974, that's when Sadat started the Infitah policy. Infitah means open door. So the open door policy was actually a package of neoliberal reforms. Very few people uh, know about this, but actually Sadat Egypt, and Pinochet's Chile were the pioneers of neoliberalism in the global south uh, at the time. We started our neoliberal reforms at the same time in 1974. So with the Infitah, this opened the door 
not just for more austerity, but it also opened the door for more struggles. In 1975, this was the year of the industrial upturn in our history. The trigger for most of the labor protests at the time were bread and butter issues, uh, for sure. But there is a political also connotation to it, which I will explain to you in a bit. But so the Helwan workers went on strike and uh, the Shubra al Khaimah uh, uh, workers went on strike in solidarity. Most of these strikes used to start over bonuses, over disparity in wages where workers feel that their socialist managers are getting really pay quadruples and, and tenfold their salaries. And they felt that, you know, this shouldn't be the case. They were uh, striking over abusive treatments in the factories. So as you can see, they were mainly bread and butter issues. But once you start striking over bread and butter issues, you are striking against the state managers. You're striking against state policies. So even when you struggle over economic issues, you get into a direct conflict with the forces of the state. So you start political generalization right away. So in 1975, all of these events snowballed into the so-called Mahalla Commune. It wasn't, of course, a commune like the Paris Commune or, you know, the commune like that socialist activists like ourselves would envision the future at, but it was dubbed as a commune because for at least three days, the Mahalla workers were in control of their town and were in control of their factories, and they were protesting in the streets. And they stormed the houses of their managers, and they got the expensive artifacts and expensive clothes of their managers, and they hung them on the trees in their town so as to show everyone what their socialist managers were really living uh, at the end of the day compared to the average worker uh, in Mahalla. And the state went ballistic. The entire town was under siege by the central security forces. By the way, our central security forces were established by the regime in 1968 after they were inspired by how the CRS in France repressed the students. So as you can see, it's not just the radicals learning from themselves, but our enemies also, they learn from themselves all the time. So the central security forces laid siege on Mahalla and the regime sent in choppers also to intimidate the workers and fighter jets were even flying at very low heights to intimidate uh, the workers. You know, this is like a military tactic, basically. This is war. I mean, when you talk about class war, this is literally class war, where you have fighter jets against strikers, unarmed strikers. Although the, the protests were violently dispersed, but this was not the end. I mean, you can say that the beast has been awakened. You know, the, the, the Egyptian working class, you know, I mean, was awakened. So in 1976, the following year, the strikes continued and they spilled over to most of the other sectors in the economy and, of course, to the student campuses. There is like a very symbolic event that happened in 1976 that just shows you to what extent the regime had lost its legitimacy. That, you know, every few years, Sadat or our president, our former presidents, they used to have a plebiscite where it's not elections. It's like you go and vote. Do you want Sadat to continue as a president or not? And people would go and vote yes and no. And of course, each time Sadat would win by 99%. So after a plebiscite where Sadat basically uh, won it by 99%, the Cairo public transport authority workers, these are the bus drivers and, and the technician workers, they went on strike and they brought the capital to an entire halt, to a complete stop. In less than 24 hours after supposedly Sadat had won the presidency by 99%, which shows you what sort of legitimacy did this guy have. Student also protests were all over Egypt at the time, 
and the students marched over the parliament. And there are also some very iconic pictures of the parliament under siege at the time. So when January 1977 came and the uprising happened, and we will discuss this in a bit, like what was the trigger? Your listeners and our comrades everywhere, they have to understand that 77 did not just happen out of the blue. There was an entire decade that preceded it, where dissent was brewing and snowballing, where the masses were getting into small fights here and there, where the students were gaining more and more experience in organizing and learning more about how the tactics of the class struggle should be conducted. That's all we've got time for in this episode. In part two, we talk more about the events of the Bread Intifada itself, available now for Patreon supporters. As always, we should say that it's only because of the support we get from listeners like you that we're able to produce this podcast. Anything you can spare to keep us going is greatly appreciated, and in return you get early access to episodes and exclusive patron-only bonus content, such as the one for this episode, in which Hossam discusses the position of Islamists and Islamic authorities to the uprising, as well as Nasser's attacks on the Egyptian workers' movement. Patrons also get access to discounted books, merch, and lots of other things as well. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, join us at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory. If you want to learn more about the Bread Intifada, we recommend you check out Hossam's master's thesis, which we link to in the show notes. You'll also find links to his website and his entire photography archive from 2003 to the present, where all his photos are available under Creative Commons license for use free of charge. And if you want to support his work, you can leave a tip via his PayPal as well. The song in this episode was Build Your Palaces by radical Egyptian songwriter Sheikh Imam. Links to stream and download in the show notes. We also want to say a huge thank you to all our patrons and a special thank you to Connor Kanatsi, Shay, James, Ariel Joya and Stone Lawson. It's you guys who make the whole working class history project possible. Anyway, that's all we've got time for for today. I hope you enjoyed the episode and thanks for listening. Now it's